Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Cavan smith Tonight, as South Africa's president vows to win in the battle against coronavirus, we speak to the country's top epidemi epidemiologist about the importance of an equitable response to the pandemic that doesn't leave developing countries behind. Also, Uganda says it's investigating reports of abducted opposition members, but the lawyer representing worried families fears that authorities won't go far enough. And the family of the Rwandan government critic arrested in Dubai and now jailed in Kigali welcomes a European Parliament resolution calling for the fair trial of Paul Rusesa Begina. But first, South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, says that the country will be getting half a million doses of the Johnson & Johnson coronavirus vaccine and that healthcare workers will be at the front of the queue. With more than 47,000 dead, South Africa is the continent's worst hit country when it comes to coronavirus. A planned immunisation rollout hit a bump after a study showed that one million AstraZeneca doses the country already had was less effective against the 501YV2 variant that's dominant in South Africa. Despite the setback, on Thursday, the Africa Centers for Disease Control said that countries on the continent without 501YV2 should stick with the AstraZeneca jab. The worldwide race for vaccines has led to calls for an equitable response to the pandemic. France 24's Sam Bradpiece sat down with Professor Salim Abdul Karim, a celebrated epidemiologist who chairs the Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19 in South Africa. And he asked him about the dangers of developing nations unequal access to vaccines. As I've seen individual countries have almost a sort of Trumpian version of me first to hell with everyone else, that kind of attitude that they think that they can go and vaccinate their populations and feel safe is just a mistaken perspective. It's simply not true. And why? Because if one country has protected itself, in other countries where the virus is continuing to spread, we are seeing the emergence of new variants. Variants that are able to escape vaccine immunity. So it's a, it's a misconception that they can be safe as an island when we are dealing with a pandemic. The truth of the matter is that in this pandemic, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And that means that we have in everyone's best interest to roll out vaccines in an equitable manner. You've been quite vocal in, in your opposition to the term uh, South African variant, um, which, which could you perhaps just explain to our viewers exactly what is the problem with this term? So it's inappropriate to refer to this variant as the South African variant. For one, we don't even know whether it actually originated in South Africa because we don't know who patient zero is. It could have been somebody from another country who came to South Africa, brought it here. It sort of creates the impression that we in South Africa created this virus and are deliberately spreading it around. How do you explain, uh, particularly on the African continent, such vast disparities between um, the levels of infection and even, even the numbers of dead? Uh, in Ivory Coast, for example, uh, less than 200 people have officially been recorded as dying from COVID-19. Partly, this is due to the younger population, that many of these countries really do not have large numbers of older people. So the younger people are getting infected, but they are not getting clinical disease, and so don't need hospitals. But even if you take the younger age group, it is not the entirety of the explanation. There is some underreporting, that's commonplace, uh, in fact, it's even commonplace outside of Africa that you get some underreporting. So there's something else. We don't yet fully know what else it could be. How do you see things going um, in the next few months? I, you might not like this as a scientist, but what's your gut feeling? Uh, are you optimistic? We are now <clears throat> in the midst of a race between the virus and humankind. 
I'm very firmly of the opinion that because we have science on our side, the humans are going to win. Sam Babi said, speaking to Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Now, Nigeria's warned protesters in Lagos against holding a planned rally in the city this Saturday. Activists have been calling for a demonstration to demand justice for those killed during protests against police brutality last year. At least 12 people were shot dead at the Lekki toll gate on October 20th. Campaigners accuse soldiers of having opened fire. The military denies this. Calls for new marches have followed the decision of a judicial panel to allow the reopening of the site. And Central African Republic says that a key road to the capital has been reopened after soldiers recaptured the town of Biloko from rebels. The army has been backed by allies from Russia and Rwanda in battling insurgents who managed to cut off roads into Bongi. The insurgent alliance launched an offensive against the government in December. The march on Bongi had raised fears of food shortages and as aid and stocks were prevented from being delivered to the city. The poor government forces launched an operation in late January and have been pushing back rebel fighters since. Now, since Uganda's elections in January, there has been an uptick in allegations of abductions by security services. Opposition candidate Bobby Wine claims that thousands of his supporters have gone missing. The national media has named over 40 people whose families say that they have disappeared. Now, Uganda's internal affairs minister has said that he is aware of a number of disappearances and that an investigation has been launched. Our reporter has spoken to the lawyer representing some of the families trying to find the missing. He says that he has lost faith in authorities' promises to uncover the truth. I'm handling around 10 cases of that nature, of extrajudicial arrests, kidnaps and abductions. The motivation is um, multifaceted, but part of the problem is impunity because people do it and they get away with it and there are no tough consequences for doing so. But it is also a political crackdown on dissent in Uganda and it's also a manifestation of militarism that, is, that has been here since the advent of the NRM leadership but has intensified over the years as they shared their pretensions to democracy. What have families and eyewitnesses said to you about what is happening? Most of the abductions happen in the deep end of the night or in the morning. It's a mixture of brain growth and uniform abductors, but quite often it's just brain growth and no wolf tracing the way about. It looks like a criminal gang doing these things. They don't identify themselves. You knock on their doors, they deny having someone even when you're sure that the person is within their custody. So the family is in uncertainty. They fear torture because these ones are very notorious for brutality and torture. But they also don't know whether their person will come out dead or alive. The families are weak financially. They cannot afford legal services, they cannot afford their own meals, their own basic necessities of life. So the abductions intensify their ordeals. Minister of Internal Affairs JJ Odongo has said that an investigation has been started. Um, do you think that investigation will be completed to the satisfaction of the families uh, that you were dealing with? There is no hope in those investigations. They will just try to deny responsibility. That's the purpose. They are just meant to paint the government clean, uh, wash it off the responsibility, and push the back, actually, to the victim. That interview by Gronia Harrington. Now, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on the case of Rwandan government critic Paul Rusisa Bagina on Thursday. The 66-year-old who inspired the film Hotel Rwanda was arrested over the summer in Dubai on his way to Burundi. Now, he usually lives in the U.S., but is now imprisoned in Kigali, accused of terrorism. He is a Belgian national, and his family has been fighting for months for Brussels to do more to get him released. Alex de Bourdon reports. Today, we are asking for justice. 
Justice for Mr. Rusa Sabagina. The family of the Rwandan activist has been waiting for these words since last summer. Known for having inspired the film Hotel Rwanda, Paul Rusasabagina was arrested in August in Dubai. He is now being held in Kigali, where he is accused of terrorism and financing rebels. Oh, my feeling is that my heart is broken. I am too worried about him. He's a cancer survivor, and he also has high blood pressure. His daughter has pinned her hopes on the MEP's resolution. For more than five months, she has been fighting for the release of her father. He became a Belgian citizen in 2000. Finally, the European Union took a stand where Belgium failed to protect its citizen. Paul Rusisa Bagina wurde angenommen. A step in the right direction, but those close to Rusa Bagina would have liked an explicit call for his immediate release. Instead, MEPs are calling for a fair trial. We prefer having a very strong resolution that calls for a fair trial, rather than having a resolution that perhaps calls for release but which is passed with very few votes. I think the signal must be strong and united. The European Parliament is looking at this case. The European Parliament's position is welcomed by Rusa Sabagina's Belgian lawyer. His client's trial is due to be held in Rwanda in less than a week. The most basic standards of international law are not respected. For example, the fact that he does not even have the right to be defended. It's been five and a half months now since we got to see him. I went to Kigali and they refused to let me see him. Despite the gesture, the EU resolution will likely put only limited pressure on Kigali. But Rusa Sabagina's lawyer hopes it will at least push Belgian authorities to become more directly involved in the case. That's it for Iron Africa for now. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.